In countries all around the world, the coronavirus pandemic brought large parts of the economy to a standstill. Many companies only survived through government aid, and some didn't make it at all. Like in Taiwan, where the tourism industry is still struggling. In other parts of the world, like Zimbabwe, the pandemic gave rise to whole new services. But we start off in Germany, where nearly all COVID-19 restrictions were lifted at the start of April. It's a huge relief to many businesses, especially nightclubs and restaurants. The masks and social distancing measures are gone, and revelers can once again enjoy Berlin nightlife with their old freedoms. Germany dropped most of its coronavirus restrictions at the beginning of April. For partygoers, it was a moment they'd been waiting for for a long time, and now they're ready to celebrate. I just had corona, so I thought, when if not now? It still feels a bit different, but it's my first time back. I think the sense of ease will return when there are more concerts again. The pandemic hit the club industry harder than most. Shuttered for two years, only state aid prevented widespread bankruptcies. But Pamela Schobis of the Berlin Club Commission fears the difficult times are not over yet. Now that this financial assistance is coming to an end, we'll see if nightclubs will survive or not. We said that from the start. For two years, nightclubs were able to ratchet down from 100 to 0 percent. They had no choice. But it's clear that from one day to the next, we can't suddenly go from 0 to 100 percent. The hospitality industry is also reeling. Due to the impact of the coronavirus and COVID restrictions, revenue dropped about 40 percent over the past two years. The Erdinger restaurant in the center of Berlin managed to survive, but many others were less fortunate. State aid couldn't compensate for the huge losses they incurred. It led to massive restaurant closures. Lots of restaurant owners had to close because they weren't in as good a location as us or couldn't get into the to-go business. Those two things actually helped us a lot. But restaurateurs who didn't have these things, who maybe had a nice restaurant but were on a side street without much traffic, they just didn't stand a chance. There's also a shortage of hospitality staff after many people left the industry. The impact of the pandemic can be seen everywhere. Germany's GDP has suffered. The economy grew last year, but by 2.7 percent, less than hoped. So should restrictions have been eased sooner? You just have to look and you'll see how many shops here are empty. Talk to people who are on reduced working hours or who work in department stores. My opinion? It's time. Enough already. What does safe mean? We're moving into an endemic situation we'll have to live with, just like the flu and other illnesses. I'm a bit torn. I think it's good to get back to more freedoms. But just dropping mask requirements in so many places and people coming together in big crowds again, it's a bit strange and it will take some getting used to. Germany's government decided that sectors that were hard hit by the crisis need a bit more freedom again. Also with the argument that infections with the Omicron variant have been comparatively mild. None of us trust this lull. We all think it will hit again next fall. We're worried that the authorities don't realize that, that somehow we'll get through this summer and then be surprised in the fall when things get worse and we have to shut again. That's a big worry for all club operators. We've only just reopened and are already thinking about what would happen if we need to close again. It would really be a catastrophe. More freedom and reviving sectors hard hit by crisis are appealing prospects. But the end of the restrictions bring new coronavirus waves, where the long-term damage could be even greater. 
The pandemic has also been devastating to Taiwan's tourism industry. The island's government imposed strict entry rules for travelers, which kept infection rates low. But it also denied many businesses their customer base. More than 100 hotels have been forced to close since the start of the pandemic due to the lack of visitors. Jenny Khan is on her way to workplace, a hotel, working the same routes she's taken for the past 20 years. But this time, she's going there to take one last look. Taipei's Imperial Hotel is said to demolished. It has to close last October because business was down due to COVID-19. The Imperial Hotel opened in 1967, and I was born that same year. We're the same age. Seeing the hotel in boom times and now seeing it close makes me sad. 90% of the hotel's business come from foreign guests. But Taiwan's strict border controls put pay to that. Management decided to lay off staff. There were 48 people in room service, but after the pandemic started, our guest numbers dropped. So we didn't need so many staff anymore. Before the hotel closed, we were down to 17. The hotel was at least able to retain its Chinese restaurants and reopen it in a different location. And Jenny Khan was able to keep her job. With her colleagues, she now sells food online. Now, the owner wants to open a new hotel in the suburb in 2024 with a focus on different types of guests. During the pandemic, many people had online meetings and worked from home. We expect a further decrease in business travel, so we want to concentrate on tourists, too. The Imperial is not the only hotel in Taiwan that has had to close due to the pandemic. More than 100 have shut down in past two years. The Sherwood is the latest. Located in Taipei City, it has hosted many political leaders for more than three decades, but closed its door in February. Tourism experts fear that the continuing ban on foreign visitors will hit the industry hard. Because they see that things are not going well in tourism, young people don't want to enter the industry. Then, when we open the borders again, only older people will work in it. The lack of young talent will be a big problem. Not only hotels, but also restaurants and stores in tourist areas are struggling. Zhang worked for years in clothing store and witnessed it go downhill. Before the pandemic, we almost had no time for lunch or dinner. But now we do. And most of the remaining time, we spend waiting for customers. There just aren't any tourists. Zhang says many restaurants that used to have a long line now do not even require reservations. That smoothie house used to be very crowded before the pandemic. You had to wait in line for a long time because it's very famous. But not anymore. Taiwan may still have some of the lowest COVID-19 infection rates in the world, but its strict entry rules have hit the tourism industry hard. As for Jenny Khan, although she enjoys learning new skills in e-commerce, she hopes to return to room service in a hotel as soon as possible. Many companies around the world are short-staffed right now because their workers have COVID-19 and are isolating at home. Our science reporter Derek Williams has spent the past two years following the pandemic, and as always, he's here to answer your questions. This time, Jimmy J wants to know, how long do COVID-19 patients remain infectious? This is, of course, not a hard and fast number um, because everyone has unique immune responses to pathogens. The length of an infection after contracting COVID-19 
varies from person to person. And it also depends on which variant that person comes down with. That said, um, based on averages, healthcare authorities have set up guidelines for isolation. Uh, it's important to know that what's called the incubation period for the disease, so how long it takes you to start showing symptoms after being exposed, that that's pegged at between 2 and 14 days. Um, with more recent variants, incubation also tends to happen faster. Uh, after being infected with the Omicron variant, for instance, most people will start to show symptoms within about three days. And the general consensus is that infected people who develop symptoms are most likely to infect others in the day or two before they start to show those symptoms themselves, as well as in the two or three days afterwards. So how long should you remain in isolation to be at least relatively sure that you won't infect anyone else? Um, there, healthcare authorities like the U.S. Centers for Disease Control draw some distinctions based on how severe your case of COVID-19 was. Um, on its spectrum, people who had moderate to severe illness should isolate for a minimum of 10 days, with that period being extended to 20 or even more days for people who are immunocompromised, because in some cases they can shed live virus for longer. Um, but the CDC and other health authorities now also generally assume that otherwise healthy people who had only mild cases or were asymptomatic are probably only contagious for a maximum of 10 days after the first symptoms appear and possibly shorter. So that's why under newer guidelines, if a patient is recovering and has no more traces of fever, they can end isolation after only five days, but they should wear a mask around others for five more days after that because they might still be infectious. Other countries have slightly different rules. Here in Germany, for example, you can end isolation after seven days with a, a negative antigen or PCR test. Um, without one, you have to isolate for 10 days. But the underlying logic is similar. It's that to be on the safe side, you should assume that even if you had a mild case of COVID-19 or had no symptoms at all, you might be infectious for up to 10 days after you had your first symptoms or had a positive test result um, for the first time. While some industries have been hit hard by the pandemic, others have flourished. Delivery services have seen huge demand thanks to lockdown and quarantine rules. In Zimbabwe, one startup not only created lots of jobs, the company also became a lifeline for people stuck at home with no other way of buying food. Thank you so much. Receiving food orders right at the doorstep has become a convenient and safe option for some residents in Zimbabwe's capital, Harare. For Karen Young, online shopping innovations helped her reduce the risk of infection during the peak of the pandemic. She regularly orders a fresh produce and food from the online startup Fresh in a Box. It's been a lifesaver. Um, I'm a single mum, so as you can see, I have a small uh, child. Uh, so for me, going to the supermarket, along with the worry of infection, um, has also been the time factor. So even now that things are, are a little bit less in, from, from a COVID perspective, I still find the deliveries invaluable just to saving me time. Online shopping is steadily growing in Zimbabwe, and it has brought many services closer to citizens in the comfort of their homes. Kudamusa Siwa founded the family-run startup Fresh in a Box. 
customers can order fresh vegetables, fruits and some additional food items online. Our innovation has made um, uh, shopping for, for the everyday individual very, very easy. They go on their phones, uh, they order from us, and then we deliver to their homes. Uh, obviously, with COVID-19 making this the new normal, um, during the big panics and the big uh, lockdowns, we became ubiquitous and we became you know, absolutely necessary for people's homes. The coronavirus pandemic has been a real boost to the online startup company. After it was founded in 2018, it only saved an average of 120 customers a day until COVID lockdowns started. Now that has shot up to more than a thousand. For Fresh in a Box, adapting to a fast changing environment has not always been easy. And the pandemic has brought many challenges. The unpredictability of policies has also been quite crazy. So sometimes you're locked down, sometimes you're not locked down. Uh, you know, a vaccination is going in, are you allowed to do this? Without? So there's been a lot of rules that we've had to learn to change and chop and change and try and remain compliant. At Fresh Farm, fresh in a box major source of vegetables, being able to sell online helped save farm produce that would have otherwise gone to waste because of COVID lockdowns. What I've learned from the pandemic is that, you know, um, humanity needs to find ways of being more sustainable in the way that it, uh, it eats, in the way that it grows, in the way that it uh, survives. Uh, we are going to have to find ways of socializing, which is not direct contact. We're going to have to find ways of survival in a space where we're not as closely knit as we used to be. The coronavirus pandemic may have brought many challenges for farmers and social innovators but it has brought many good lessons to consider for the future. For those who don't get their food delivered and aren't keen on going to the supermarket, other ways of procuring food have emerged during the pandemic. The Colombian capital, Bogota, now has over 4,000 urban gardens that are keeping entire families supplied with homegrown fruit and vegetables. And aside from providing food, Many find the gardening itself quite therapeutic. Working in the garden is the perfect start to the day for Diego Gutierrez. He farms a small green strip in front of his house. It was the first city garden of its kind to be officially approved in Bogotá. The idea of creating a garden started during the pandemic, when we were all cooped up inside. Being confined like that felt awful. So the residents got together and worked out how we could stop ourselves from going stir-crazy and decided to start a garden. It also made sense because certain food items were hard to come by. The public space in front of our house seemed like a good place. It was in poor condition, and homeless people often left their garbage on it. So the first thing we had to do was clean it up. Then we could start learning how to be gardeners. There were a few things Diego Gutierrez first needed to learn. But now his harvests are pretty good. Tomatoes, onions, coffee plants, lettuce and cabbage all thrive on what used to be a neglected strip of land. The urban gardens also offer a second chance to farmers who have fled to the city to escape the violence in other parts of Colombia. The city authorities assigned Mariela Pardo a plot of land and she's been farming it ever since. I'm used to working in the field, so I was happy when they gave us this little piece of land, because at then at least we had something to do. It keeps me fit. I turned 66 in February, so that's important. Working in the field is good for my health and clears my mind. Mariela Pardo once learned how to farm from her father, now she's passing on that knowledge to her grandson, Luis. The initiative is supported by the city's botanic gardens. They organize special days where people can plant things under supervision. They also provide classes. The larger goal is to promote local agriculture. 
Our goal is to provide more than 40,000 people with technical assistance and training to more than 20,000 people. And we want to supply basic tools to more than 20,000 community gardens. The harvest from the gardens helps to feed each family, relieving the pressure on household budgets. Whenever she harvests something, Mariela Pardo always thinks about the farm she lost. I'll do this as long as God gives me the strength. I'm so thankful for my garden. Perhaps one day he'll help me to harvest a little more. Diego Gutierrez believes the gardens will help pave the way to a better future, a more sustainable vision of progress in urban areas. Making the city look pretty has always meant concrete, stone and nice pavement. But the gardens are far prettier and more productive too. The pandemic has brought change to Bogotá. The new urban gardens have made the city more green and are helping to build strong communities. Many sectors were forced to adapt and find ways to survive during the pandemic. For the performing arts, it was especially tough. In Britain, many theaters had to close. And so they sought alternative ways to perform for the public. For actors, directors, and everyone involved in theater, it was often the only way of safeguarding their livelihood. Here, in the heart of London's famous theater district, the days of COVID lockdowns almost seem like their own work of fiction, in which a crowded auditorium was the stuff of nightmares. But these theatre enthusiasts are now itching to get back to their seats. Oh, I think it's brilliant. I think it's exactly what we need. Oh, it's absolutely wonderful. We've come all the way from Wales to see this. Hopefully everyone inside will be wearing their masks and we'll be fine. I think I caught COVID the last time I went to the theatre. So. Okay. Any now today? <laughs> no, not at all. Really looking forward to it. Very excited. There's no fear anymore. We're just sort of back to normal, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> back to life. After three lockdowns and months of restrictions, the West End's slowly bouncing back. But for many smaller independent theatres, the legacy of COVID lingers. It's the worst thing you have to do if you're a theatre manager, is close your theatre. It just sort of was a, a punch in the gut, really. Lockdowns saw the team at London's Orange Tree Theatre lose their livelihoods overnight. Asking people to come to an intimate theatre, and we prided ourselves and traded on being an intimate theatre. All of our lives' work was now come to a point where what we were dedicated to doing was both illegal and toxic. Get yourself a career first and make money. Since then, at times, it wasn't clear whether the theatre would ever reopen. Two things seemed very stark. One was that um, we were going to run out of money, that we would be bankrupt. And my experience of the British theatre is that when theatres close, it's very difficult for them to reopen. So it was fingertip stuff, really. It, you know, it, it was an existential threat. Is she as chaste as a future queen? Fast forward to today and restrictions are lifted and the theatre's back in action. Rehearsing German drama Tom Fool. Still, she's German. Oh, German girls, eh? Even the King of Sweden's hooked. She's got him in her grip. Well, well. Like many theatres, they survived with the help of government support. But Covid cases are soaring once again in the UK and cast sickness is still shutting down performances. Audience sizes are also down significantly on pre-pandemic levels. For some, that's due to COVID concerns. Others are simply out of the habit. Paul fears this could have a lasting impact on smaller, independent theatres. The great big blockbuster theatre experiences like Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cinderella is still very popular. They'll spend a lot of money on a big night out, but they won't go back to spending their regular sums of money coming to see a couple of plays a week if they're not absolutely sure they're going to have a good time. But the show must go on. And if COVID's taught them anything, it's how to adapt. Restrictions accelerated their move online. They started streaming performances to help stay afloat. Their digital content is now not only reaching new audiences, it's an important financial lifeline. People that either can't come in the first place because of the pandemic 
or, or find coming, coming physically to the theatre anyway very difficult, now have access to our work in a way that they didn't before. It's been a process born out of necessity, but it's fulfilled a long-term dream. Gentlemen of legend. And with that, the stage is set for a new post-COVID future. Where once the move online may have felt a challenge too far, now it's a ray of hope and a sign that theatre, in whatever form, will always find a way to endure. Bring me the other one. The pandemic wreaked havoc in many industries, while for others, it opened up new opportunities. It also highlighted how globally interconnected we are. Just think of all the interruptions to supply chains, for example. We'll return to that thought in our next show, exploring the concept of One Health. We'll see how the health of humans, animals, and our environment are all linked together. Until then, take care. <laughs>